to page uh, D13, bone tissue. The cells that make up bone tissue are reasonably enough called osteocytes, bone cells. And just like cartilage cells, they also are surrounded by a pool of fluid called a lacuna, just like in cartilage cells. These bone cells secrete uh, both calcium salts and collagen. Uh, they, so they do secrete collagen, and they uh, very obviously, we all know there's calcium in, in bones, so uh, they secrete calcium salts. There are two calcium salts, calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate. We actually talked about that, I think, back on page E1. E1, when we were first learning about the functions of the skeletal system. Uh, certainly in this anatomy class, we'll write out the terms calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate. But as I may have mentioned before, those mean, really cruel physiology teachers would never waste their time writing out the words. They would write out the molecular formula. So the, uh, you don't have to know this for this class, but the molecular formula for calcium phosphate is Ca3 quantity PO42, and calcium carbonate is CaCO3. Again, I'm not testing you on that in this class. Uh, cal of the two, calcium phosphate is the harder of these two minerals, uh, more so than calcium carbonate, which is a little bit softer. Later, when we get to teeth, when we get to the digestive system, we will learn that the enamel of a tooth, which is the hardest substance in the body, is pure calcium phosphate. There is no calcium carbonate, so that's why it's really hard. Uh, bone tissue is highly vascularized. I recognize that when you're holding these bones in your hands, looking at them, you're thinking, this isn't, how could this have blood vessels in it? It's like just a bunch of calcium mineral. But that's because you're just looking up a dried up uh, piece of bone with just calcium mineral. There are no living cells within it, and there are no blood vessels. But in real life, if you break a bone, it bleeds. There are blood vessels running within that uh, bone. bone. And uh, it does, it is a living tissue, as we've said. If you break a bone, it grows back together again. So, because there are living cells in it. Now, uh, in uh, item, on D13, if you've just walked in, D13, item D, uh, we wrote that bone tissue is only capable of growing in width. What does that mean? We'll come back to that in a few minutes. There are actually two types of bone tissue, two types, compact bone tissue and spongy, also known as cancellous bone tissue. I want you to know about both but I only put an asterisk or star in front of compact bone. So that's the only one you need to recognize under a microscope. Before I, uh, I indicated the compact bone tissue, the osteocytes, the bone cells are arranged in concentric circles called aversion systems. And you probably are scratching your head thinking, what does that mean? And I'll explain it. Spongy or cancellous bone, the osteocytes are arranged in a spongy network. And you're probably scratching your head thinking, what does that mean? I'm going to show you a picture. Just before we do, though, there are actually two types of bone cells. Two types of bone cells. There are osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And when I mention that, our first thought is, you've got to be kidding osteoblasts and osteoclasts are the names of two types of bone cells. Now, uh, obviously, osteo means bone. The only difference between these two words is a letter B and a letter C. What do osteoblasts do? Those are the bone cells that secrete <coughs> calcium mineral. They are secreting calcium mineral and collagen. They are forming bone tissue. They promote ossification. So when they're secreting calcium mineral, they're causing, they're causing ossification, increased calcium mineral in the bone. But here's something that'll surprise you. There are other bone cells called osteoclasts, and they actually dissolve or break down bone tissue. They actually dissolve or break down the calcium mineral in bone tissue, and uh, they cause, when bone tissue breaks down, that's called bone resorption. Bone resorption. Now, you, you may be noticing I wrote something right here in front of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Uh, I mean, whether you write this down right now, I'm not going to talk about it. So if you're wondering, what does it say? This says calcitonin. This is parathyroid hormone. Don't worry about that. 
I mean, if you want to write it down, you may, but I'm not even going to talk about it. We will talk about calcitonin and parathyroid hormone when we get to section Q on endocrinology. And we will learn about hormones that speed up the activity of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. But we're not going to deal with that right now. So uh, all we're saying is there are two types of bone cells. And this is a pattern that we're going to see throughout this class. And you will see it even more, this pattern, when you take physiology. You say, what are you talking about? You'll notice that osteoblasts form bone tissue. Osteoclasts break down bone tissue. I call this a kind of yin and yang, right? There's like two opposite ways of working. This is really common in our body. Throughout our body, we have a lot of things going on where one, pro uh, one type of cell or one process increases something and another type of cell or process decreases something. As long as these two types of cells or processes are in balance, then everything's wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. It's only when one of these cells or processes starts to become more than the other one or less than the other one that we go out of balance, and that causes a problem. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, imagine right now in all of you, osteoblasts are forming, they're secreting calcium mineral, and at the very same time, the osteoclasts are dissolving or breaking down bone mineral, so the total amount of calcium in your bones is staying about constant. We have learned back in section B about menopause. We said that when a woman reaches about 50 years of age, her ovaries stop working, and her ovaries stop secreting estrogen. So there's a drop in the estrogen hormone level at menopause. We talked about that. We said that causes all kinds of changes. We talked about how that activates autolysis in the cells of a woman's womb, her uterus, and it starts to atrophy or shrink. But another thing that happens, when the ovary stops secreting estrogen, the osteoblasts start, they secrete less calcium. So that drop in the estrogen hormone level causes a slowing down of the osteoblasts. If the osteoblasts are secreting less calcium now, but the osteoclasts are still breaking down the bone as fast as usual, that explains why women tend to develop osteoporosis. Osteoporosis literally means that the bone, osteo, becomes more porous. Less, uh, the bone density, there's less calcium mineral in the bones than uh, previously, and the bones become brittle and weak. So that's really because at menopause, these are no longer in balance. Okay, so that's, you've all heard, most of you have heard, and we've even mentioned how osteoporosis is another probably more serious thing that happens at menopause than even the shrinking of the womb. All right, we will have more to say about these processes and the hormones that affect these cells when we get to endocrinology. All right, on the next page, D14. On D14, at the top right, You'd say, what page are we? D14, right here. Now, uh, here's a bone. It's kind of a cutaway view of the bone. Anybody recognize what bone this is? That's the femur. Now, I'm not testing you on a picture of a bone. I'm going to test you on the real femur. Incidentally, I assume you all know this by now. It is so much easier to learn the bones when you're holding them in their hand than looking at a picture. We really learn them by holding and touching. And that's how we'll test you also, not just on a picture. Anyhow, this is the femur. This is the big head and the greater trochanter. But it doesn't really matter. Let's magnify. Let's enlarge this. And looking at this, this is a, kind of a magnified view. You'll notice right here the bone tissue looks really dense, really thick. That's called compact bone. Compact bone is really dense, very high in calcium mineral. But actually, most of the inside of the bone is this more porous, more porous bone tissue called spongy bone or cancellous bone. They mean the same thing. 
Now, an obvious question is, well, why isn't our bone, to, uh, our bone, our femur, made entirely of that really strong, compact bone? Why does it have, you know, the inside spongy bone? Look, our bones are plenty strong. Most of us have never broken any of our bones, and even if you do, it heals pretty nicely. So there, our bones are more than adequately strong. If our bones were totally compact bone tissue, they would weigh so much more that they would uh, it, it impair our ability to run and jump. We've talked about this back in section E1. We said our skeletal system is kind of a maximizing of providing sufficient protection and strength where we need it, but not so much strength and protection that it weighs us down and prevents us from moving. So uh, the, this is just to make the bone a little bit lighter than it would be if it was solid bone tissue. Uh, let's look at this lower picture. And uh, this is another bone. Does anybody recognize what bone this is? That's the tibia, that's right, the shin bone, the thick bone of the lower leg. Again, I'm not testing you on a picture, but it is a tibia. It's an adult tibia. Uh, so let's look at the parts of this typical long bone. Uh, first of all, the ends of the bone are called an epiphysis. Uh, epiphysis starts with the letter E. That's the E, or end, of the uh, bone. And there is obviously the proximal end, closest to the body, and the distal. Epiphysis more distant than the farther in. Now, uh, uh, the uh, shaft of the bone is called the diaphysis. So, uh, you say, like, do we have to know these words? 100%. Yes. The shaft is the diaphysis. Now, covering the outer surface of the entire bone, protecting it, is that periosteum, that uh, membrane, that sheath of dense fibrous connective tissue, regularly arranged dense fibrous connective tissue. It's actually made up of the very same tissue that makes up a tendon or a ligament. Uh, you'll notice that right here on the right, it shows a, a vessel, a little artery, labeled a nutrient artery going into the bone, and it goes through a little hole called the nutrient foramen. All right, and that artery then branches and supplies what's called the marrow cavity or medullary cavity. So medullary or marrow cavity mean the same thing. <clears throat> now, uh, you'll notice in this kind of cutaway section, here it's showing on the outer surface of the bone is that very dense compact bone tissue. But really in the middle of the bone is this more porous spongy uh, bone or a uh, cancellous bone so that the bone is not quite so heavy. Uh, let's look at this at even a little bit higher magnification by looking at the lower right. On the lower right, starting on the right-hand side, here's that outer protective covering called the periosteum. And right, uh, that's the covering around the bone, the outer surface of the bone. And the outer part of the bone is this really thick, heavy, dense, compact bone tissue. And here is this more porous, spongy bone tissue. Let's try to understand bone tissue a little bit better, especially the compact bone, because that's the one we're asking you to recognize under the microscope. On the next page on D15, so on D15, let's look at this uh, picture in the middle. And starting in the middle of the page on the left-hand side, middle of the page on the left-hand side, here is that covering on the outer surface of the bone called the paraosteum. That's made up of the same tissue as a tendon or ligament, regularly arranged dense fibrous connective tissue. You'd say, can you say that slower? I've got to write that down. It's page D11. D11, we said, learned that regularly arranged dense fibrous connective tissue makes up not only the tendon, not only the ligament, not only the dura mater, not only the fascia, but also periosteum and perichondrium. D11, all right? You'd say, like, so we have to know that. Well, I've repeated it about seven times. You, you figure it out. We're out the letter. I'm going to ask you to know it. All right, now, uh, here uh, we see compact bone tissue. Compact bone tissue. This is compact bone. And way over here on the right, here's a little bit of the spongy bone. So you get a sense of the difference in texture, right? Compact, spongy, or cancellous. 
Now, the compact bone tissue is actually where the bone cells, the osteocytes, are arranged in concentric rings. And your first thought is, what, what are concentric rings? What if I said that the bone cells are arranged very much like the rings of a tree? Doesn't it kind of look like the rings of a tree? All right, let's uh, magnify that more right up here at the top. So here's the osteocytes uh, in compact bone tissue. Notice they are surrounded by a pool of fluid called a lacuna. And these bone cells then secrete calcium salts, calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate, and collagen into the spaces between the cells. Notice how in compact bone tissue, the bone cells are arranged in rings, very much like the rings of a tree. So here we can see that. And what's interesting is in the very, and each of these tree-like structures is called a haversion system. You'd say, where's that? It's written right here, haversion system or osteon. In the very center of each haversion system, in the very center of each tree, is a canal where an artery is passing right through this canal. The canal is called the haversion canal. And these are called haversion systems. Now, we've got another view of this at the bottom of the page. And this is really what the, the, when you look at the compact bone tissue under the microscope, it looks absolutely identical to this. It looks like a bunch of trees, right? And these are the rings of the tree. Each one of these is called a haversion system, each one. And in the center is a haversion canal where an artery passes through. So even though this is really dense bone tissue, there's still arteries passing up through each of these trees or in the middle or haversion systems. All right, and, and again, the, your, when you look at compact bone tissue under the microscope, it was out last time, it's out to, it'll be out today, it'll look just like this, and you have a photograph in your lab manual that looks just like this as well. All right, so that's what compact bone tissue looks like at the microscopic level. Now, on page D16, and they categorize bones, and they talk about four types, long bones, short bones, flat bones, and irregular bones. It's pretty simple. So here's an example, letter A, of a long bone. Does anybody recognize which long bone that is? That's the humerus. That's the humerus. And again, I'm not testing you on a picture. I'll test you on the real bone. That's an example of a long bone. A femur is a long bone. A tibia is a long bone. Any bone that's kind of long is a long bone. Here, figure B is an example of a short bone. That's one of the phalanges. I have no idea which one, uh, but the phalanges are short bones. And uh, probably so would a metacarpal bone be a, uh, a short bone. Uh, figure C is an example of a flat bone. And all the bones of the skull are basically flat. Anybody recognize which skull bone that is? Occipital. The occipital bone. That's the foramen magnum. Now, I'm not testing you on a loose occipital bone, but uh, all the skull bones are flat bones. And then uh, here, that's obviously a vertebra. That's an example of what's listed here as an irregular bone. And that's probably a lumbar vertebra because it's got a big, heavy body and a short, uh, relatively short spinous process. But anyhow, uh, we'll test you on a real lumbar vertebra. Uh, and what's listed next, right below that on D16, is the structure of the long bone. We've already said that the shaft is called the diaphysis. The ends of the bone are called the epiphysis. We have a proximal epiphysis and distal epiphysis. And then I wrote something here, epiphyseal plates, and I wrote the word child, and lines, and I wrote the word adult. I will explain that very shortly. I'm going to skip that for the moment. The medullary cavity is another name for the marrow cavity. The medullary cavity. Now, if, there's, if the marrow cavity is filled with a bunch of blood and it's actively producing blood cells, it's called red marrow. But if the marrow cavity is filled with fat, adipose tissue, fat, and it's not producing blood cells, it's called yellow marrow. What about your femur? In, in, your, in your body, your own femur, what do you think would be in the marrow cavity of your femur? Yellow Red marrow. marrow or yellow marrow? Yellow. yellow marrow. 
You'd say, how did they know that? We learned at the bottom of page E1 that by the time you're 20, 25 years old, you're the, the femur and, in fact, most bones of your body are no longer producing blood cells. Uh, they, the marrow cavity is just filled with fat. The only bones that are actively, that are all bloody on the inside and actively producing uh, red blood cells, they're filled with red marrow, are which bones? Which bones are most pro The sternum, the vertebrae, the ribs. All right, and that was on the bottom of E1. And, and really, those are all axial skeleton, right? Axial skeleton, your vertebral column, your ribs, your, your sternum, that's all axial. You'd say, how do I know which one's axial, which one's uh, appendicular, page E2. The uh, appendicular refers to the appendages, right? The limbs, the extremities. And uh, basically, by the time you're 20, 25 years old, uh, those marrow cavities have uh, all become fatty. Uh, on D17, on D17, at the top, what's the structure of a flat bone? And you'll, you'll notice, incidentally, we are getting close to the end of section D. All right. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, an example of a flat bone we've just learned are these skull bones. All the skull bones are flat. Uh, here there's a black mark on this skull bone. Which skull bone is this one? Parietal. That's the parietal. Okay, again, I'm not going to test you on a picture, but <coughs> test you on a real skull. That's the parietal bone. What, is the, what do flat bones look like? So this is kind of a cutaway view of a typical flat bone of the skull. Uh, it's like a sandwich. There's a periosteal membrane on the top surface. Right underneath that, that dense, compact bone. In the middle is a layer of spongy bone. And in this, the spongy bone of the skull, the skull bones, the spongy bone inside these flat skull bones, is also commonly known by a French name, diploe, diploe. So spongy bone, cancellous bone, diploe, they all mean the same thing. That's just a term they use for this spongy bone that's in the flat skull bones. And then right underneath this middle layer of spongy bone is a bottom layer of compact bone, and on the very bottom surface, another layer of periosteum. So it's like a sandwich, it's like an Oreo cookie. Right, a periosteum, compact bone, spongy bone, compact bone, periosteum. All right, so that's what it looks like. Now, we're getting to just about uh, the last topic here in section D. I want to briefly talk about the embryologic development of bones. Now, uh, I'm going to keep it simple, uh, re relatively brief and simple. Basically, the way that our bones form, the way they embryologically develop, is in two ways. The long bones of our body, such as our arm and leg bones, right? Femur, tibia, humerus, radius, ulna, they develop out of cartilage. That's called endochondral bone formation. Endo means within, chondro means cartilage. So they're going to develop out of cartilage. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Look, jump to page D19. D19, and on page D19, you'd say, what page D19? But the flat bones, say, of the skull, the flat bones of the skull develop by a different type of method called intramembranous bone formation. So the bo long bones of our arms and legs, they develop out of cartilage, and the bones of our skull and a few other plate bones in our body, they develop through a different method called intramembranous bone formation. So these are the two ways. Let's go back to page D17, and we'll walk our way through this. So we're on page D17, and we're learning how the long bones of our body develop. All right, we're going to keep it simple again. The bones, what will become a femur, what will become a humerus, starts out made up of mesodermal cells. Now that ought to make sense. You'd say, yeah, why? Because bone is a connective tissue, and all connective tissues develop from mesoderm. That's one of the characteristics of connective tissue. I reviewed that right at the beginning today. So this is going to become a femur, a tibia, a humerus, and it starts out made up of mesodermal cells. These mesodermal cells then differentiate 
You'd say they what? They specialize into cartilage cells or chondrocytes. So they, be, they change and become car cartilage cells or chondrocytes and they form hyaline cartilage. So this femur has gone from being made up of mesodermal cells to hyaline cartilage. And then what happens? In figure C, in figure C, right here in the middle of this femur or humerus, right in the middle of the shaft, the diaphysis, it starts to change into bone tissue. This area where it first starts to be changed into bone tissue is called the primary or first ossification center. So that's the primary or first ossification center. The word ossify means to become bone. Now everywhere else it's still hyaline cartilage. If we look at figure D, all that's been added between figure C and figure D is an artery has grown into the primary ossification center. An artery has grown into That's that nutrient artery. Okay, figure E. You'd say, what a mess. What's this? Okay. All right, in figure E, the entire shaft of the bone, the diaphysis, has become bone tissue. Now, the ends of the bone, both the proximal end up here and the distal end, the proximal and distal epiphysis, now they are becoming, undergoing ossification. They are becoming bone tissue. So these are called the secondary ossification centers. The secondary are at the ends of the bone. Now you'll notice that if this, in the shaft, the diaphysis is bone tissue, and the ends of the bone are becoming bone tissue, the last place where there's still a thin layer of hyaline cartilage is right here and right here. And these last remaining areas that still have hyaline cartilage are called the epiphyseal plates or growth plates. So this is an epiphyseal plate and this is an epiphyseal plate. That's the area where there's still a layer of hyaline cartilage. Here and here. Right between the epiphysis that's ossifying and the diaphysis that's ossifying. There's more to this. Let's go back to page, page D13. On D13, I put an arrow under item 5D, and we wrote bone tissue is only capable of growing in width. Bone tissue can grow wider, but it cannot grow longer. But we know that our bones do grow longer. That's how we grow taller. Let's go back to D12, the previous page, D12. And on D12, we were learning about cartilage on D12. And I put an arrow on D12, item 4D. Cartilage tissue, we wrote, is capable of growing in both length and width. Cartilage can grow not only wider, but longer. Now let's look on page, find it here, D18. Page D18. Okay, let's look at this picture. All right, right here on your right, it says bone of the epiphysis. This is the end of the bone that is ossified. Right here, I circled, it says bone of the diaphysis. This is the shaft of the bone, the diaphysis, and it's bone tissue. So didn't we learn that right between the bone tissue of the diaphysis or shaft and the bone tissue at the end, the epiphysis, here on the left, it says this is the epiphyseal plate of hyaline cartilage. Now, the epiphyseal plate is also known as the growth plate. Why is it called the growth plate? Because this hyaline cartilage grows taller, longer. And as it grows taller or longer, it changes into bone tissue. Just like the earlier, the uh, hyaline cartilage had changed into bone tissue in the diaphysis and in the epiphysis, the shaft and the end of the bone. So this means that how a bone grows in length is the cartilage grows in length and changes into bone tissue because bone tissue cannot grow longer. As long as there's a layer of hyaline cartilage right here, 
the bone can continue to grow longer. Once all of the hyaline cartilage has changed into bone tissue, the, your bone can no longer grow longer. It can still grow wider or thicker, but it can no longer grow longer or taller. So this is how our bones, interestingly, grow. They grow from the epiphyseal plate or growth plate. You'll notice on the right, it actually says zone of resting cartilage, zone of proliferating. You'd say, what does proliferating mean? Growing cartilage, zone of hypertrophying cartilage, zone of calcifying cartilage, where it's ossifying or changing into bone tissue. So the bone grows in length from this area. Now, at the bottom, uh, oh, one more thing here we wrote on the top. There are actually two hormones, and I am going to talk about these two hormones right now, but we'll learn more about them later in the course. There are two hormones that actually stimulate, they promote the growth of hyaline cartilage at the epiphyseal plates. They cause it to grow more rapidly in length. Those hormones are called growth hormone and testosterone. Now, growth hormone, just from the name, sounds like a good name. Sounds like growth hormone probably helps you grow. We'll learn later, it's a hormone secreted from your pituitary gland. We won't worry about that for right now. So a uh, growth hormone causes this cartilage to grow faster and therefore promotes the long lengthening of our bones to grow taller. Now, both men and women have growth hormone. Guys, in addition, produce this male sex hormone called testosterone. Women don't secrete testosterone. Testosterone, like growth hormone, also promotes growth of the hyaline cartilage, promoting lengthening or elongation of the bone. And this is why uh, guys, uh, on average, are taller than women on average, uh, because they have two hormones stimulating the growth of hyaline cartilage at the epiphyseal plates, whereas women have only one of the two. So uh, if we looked at, let's say, a brother and sister, on the assumption that a typical brother and sister are genetically similar, not identical, but similar, the brother's almost always going to be taller than the sister because of these two hormones stimulating the growth of the bones, whereas the sister has only one of these two hormones. Now, I try to uh, reproduce. These are x-rays of a child's bones, and I tried to show the epiphyseal plates. It, it didn't reproduce real well. But I want you to notice this on the x-rays, on the x-rays here. I don't know if this is still videotaping or not. Is it? Okay. So uh, now uh, I've got this, uh, of course, as I block your view. Uh, this is all on, uh, we've got the x-rays and you've got the video of the uh, x-rays. Anyhow, I, I know this is probably blocking so. The, uh, the, right here, what we have, this is the femur and tibia and fibula. Is everybody okay on that? Those are lug bones. Uh, so now, this is of an adult and this is a child. Okay, this is an adult and this is a child. Now, it's not a really young child because the bones are pretty big. But if you look on the fe uh, femur here, this femur is thicker and wider than this femur of the child. Now, of the adult, this is all bone tissue, and it cannot grow longer. But if you look at this child, and I think all of you may be able to see this, does it look like it's broken right here? Can you see that? It looks like there's a break in the tibia, and that's where I've got a number. In fact, it also looks like there's a break in the femur. That's where the cartilage is. Because, and why is that, you know, different color? Because x-rays go through cartilage, but they don't go through bone. So that causes a difference in the appearance on the x-ray. So you can see on the child's bones the epiphyseal plate of hyaline cartilage. And in fact, that's what, uh, that's what the uh, uh, doctors will look at. Uh, let's say that a... Uh, a parent is concerned about whether their son is, uh, is growing properly. He seems to be really short for his age. Uh, so what the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take an x-ray of some of the bones 
and they're going to see, is there still this epiphyseal plate of cartilage in his bones? If there is, he can still grow taller. If there isn't, or if the cartilage is almost gone, that means he's almost finished growing. So uh, that would be the basis of telling the parents, don't worry, there's still uh, plenty of growth cartilage, they'll call it the growth plate, and uh, let's give it time, he's just gonna be slow for his age. All right, if they say it's almost gone, and let's say the uh, kid is uh, 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 15 or 16 years old and he's really short, so then they may say, you know, the cartilage is almost gone. Then they would want to measure his growth hormone levels. Because growth hormone, and we're going to write this down in a moment, is what stimulates the cartilage to grow. So on D16, D16. So on D16, we told you to write down epiphyseal plate to write the word child. So if you can see those growth plates, we know it's a child. Now, strangely, if you don't see the growth plates, if you don't see the epiphyseal plates, they call it an epiphyseal line, even though you don't see anything. Now, remember, when you don't see anything, they call it a line. When you actually see a line, that's a plate. On D19, so the flat bones develop by what's called intramembranous bone formation. So uh, this, that means this is not growing out of cartilage. It's actually growing out of fibrous connective tissue. So let's look at the pictures here. Incidentally, the legend that explains the pictures is right here on the right. So you can read this over, but what, uh, what the legend is saying on the right is what I'm going to explain on the left. So what will become a skull bone starts out made out of mesodermal cells. These are mesodermal cells. They're sometimes called mesenchymal. So these are mesodermal cells. All right, that will become the bone. And then what happens is that these mesodermal cells dis uh, differentiate. They become fibroblasts. They become fibroblasts. And these fibroblast cells secrete collagen protein. These are fibroblast cells. They secrete collagen protein. And this is called fibrous connective tissue. This is a dense fibrous connective tissue. We, after all, we had learned that dense fibrous connective tissue is made up of fibroblasts and collagen. So what we're saying is the mesodermal cells became fibroblast cells. And then what happens next is this area right in here starts to undergo ossification. What does that mean? It's turning into bone. It's turning into bone. And eventually, eventually the whole thing becomes bone. I'm keeping it simple. Okay, so, uh, in summary, how did the skull bones form? They went from mesodermal cells to fibroblasts and uh, making up a tissue called dense fibrous connective tissue to bone tissue. Okay, it became bone tissue. So, in other words, when you look at a fetal skull, you know those soft spots, those fontanelles? Those fontanelles are made up of dense fibrous connective tissue. It's the dense fibrous connective tissue that hasn't yet ossified. It hasn't calcified. It hasn't yet become bone tissue. So that soft spot, is that a fetal skull right there? So in other words, uh, that wouldn't be cartilage. It's fibrous connective tissue. A little bit different. So, let's, so let me compare in contrast. How did the skull bones develop and how did the long bones develop? It's really similar. In both cases, in the long bones, we went from mesoderm to cartilage to bone. Is everybody okay on that? Mesoderm to cartilage to bone. That's called endochondral bone formation, meaning within the cartilage. What about the skull bones that went from mesoderm to fibrous connective tissue to bone? That's called intramembranous bone formation. 
So the only real difference is whether the intermediate stage is cartilage or whether it's dense fibrous connective tissue. They both begin in mesoderm, they both end in bone tissue. The question is, in, in the long bones, cartilage is occurring in the intermediate step, and in the skull bones, dense fibrous connective tissue is. Uh-huh. Well, a baby is born with that soft spot. It hasn't yet ossified. So it still continues. By the time they're about two years old, they've got a pretty hard skull. All right. We have finished bone tissue. There's one last tissue, connective tissue, uh, and that's blood. So uh, on page D19, D19, uh, it's called hemopoietic, which is a fancy way of saying blood. We can just call it blood. For right now, I don't have to make it worse than it has to be. Now, uh, what, what is blood made of? Blood is made up of cells and fluid called plasma. There are red blood cells, we know are pro more properly called erythrocytes. What do red blood cells do? They carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. There are white blood cells, which are more properly called leukocytes, and they de defend us against bad guys. Some of them produce antibodies, proteins, some of them swallow up or phagocytize foreign agents like bacteria. Now, there's also platelets, but I'm not going to test you on platelets, at least for right now. So don't worry about it. Ignore that. All right, now, on uh, D20, in addition to the cells, in addition to the c blood cells, the red blood cells and white blood cells, the erythrocytes and leukocytes, there is this fluid called plasma. And the plasma is made up of water and proteins. So in other words, the plasma is the intercellular matter between the cells. Remember, the characteristic of connective tissues is they're made up of cells with stuff between the cells. So blood is cells, and, with, and the stuff between the cells is called plasma, which is water and proteins. Now, uh, the proteins that are in the plasma are primarily made by the, your liver cells. And that you should know. I do want you to know that that is important. Okay? Your liver cells produce these pr plasma proteins. Now, uh, there are really... Uh, if these are red blood cells or erythrocytes, uh, there's really five different types of white blood cells, and then each of those types is further subdivided. Uh, we may or may not have time in this class to talk about all the different types of, of white blood cells. There's a, you don't have to know these for this test. Uh, there's a neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, and they each have different functions. Now, we have focused on epithelial tissues and connective tissues. Uh, there are two other types of tissues, muscle and nerve tissues. We will learn muscle tissues when we get to the muscle system, and we will learn about nerve tissues when we get to the nervous system. So we're covering two of the four categories of tissues for this first exam. Now, what's listed next is basically stuff we've already learned about back in section B when we're learning about cells. What's a tumor or neoplasm? It's an abnormal growth of cells. There's increased numbers of cells that shouldn't be there. We know that tumors can be described as being benign or malignant. What's the difference? A benign tumor, there's increased cell division, increased multiplication of cells, increased mitosis. That means formation of cells. Uh, but that's it. This increased mass of cells is staying in one place. It's not moving, it's not migrating, it's not metastasizing. So all that it requires is the surgical removal of that benign tumor. Now, on page D21, the last page of uh, histology, uh, malignant tumors. So again, we know what a malignant tumor is. We cover this back at section B. A malignant means evil. It's also called cancer. In this case, not only is there increased multiplication of these uh, tumor cells, but what makes it worse is they are metastasizing. 
Metastasis means they are spreading, they are migrating, they are leaving their site of origin and they are spreading all over the body. So if somebody had, let's say, a liver cancer, a malignant liver tumor, that means these abnormal liver cells are multiplying and they are leaving the liver, they are moving, traveling out of the liver and spreading throughout the entire abdomen. So then you've got these cancer cells all over the body. Uh, if it's a lung cancer, again, it spreads out of the lungs. It's metastasizing. Now, in this case, they use surgery to remove the main malignant tumor, and then they have to use radiation and chemotherapy to kill these cancerous cells that have already spread. And uh, we've learned about that. We know that these radiation and chemotherapy kill all rapidly dividing cells. And that will hopefully kill the cancer cells, but we know in the process it kills skin cells and the cells lining our alimentary canal and our blood cells and a lot of other things that causes the classic symptoms that a lot of us are familiar with uh, that happen when people are getting chemotherapy and radiation. Now, one last thing here. There, uh, we name, we categorize cancers based upon what tissue the cancer originated from. Most cancers are called carcinomas. 85% of cancers are called carcinomas. You know what that means? It originated in an epithelial tissue. So it means that epithelial cells became cancerous. They became abnormal. And you should know what a carcinoma means. It's a cancer that originated in an epithelial tissue. And that's where most cancers originate. Now, uh, leukemia. Leukemia is called that because it originates in leukocytes, white blood cells, leukocytes. So it, 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 interestingly, white blood cells can become cancerous. Any kind of cell can become cancerous. And when white blood cells become cancerous, that's called leukemia. And we're just going to give you one last one to know. Sarcoma. Just these three. Very few cancers are, are called sarcomas. What is a sarcoma? A cancer that originates in a connective tissue. So what's an example of a sarcoma? Bone cancer. That's technically called an osteosarcoma because bone is a connective tissue. So now you can see that learning about histology or tissues is important because it's actually part of the basis where we categorize or classify cancers based upon what cells became cancerous. Was it an epithelial cell, a connective tissue cell, a white blood cell? And that's how we get the names carcinoma, sarcoma, leukemia, and